Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Night Skies of Fort Collins. Uh, once again, my name is Ben Gondras, and I'm the Dome Theater Manager at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery. And it is my pleasure to get to bring this program to you uh, every week. Well, actually, every other week now. We've kind of switched up our schedule a little bit. Um, you can check out our Facebook page for more information about that. Uh, but to bring this program to you, to tell you a little bit about what you can find in the night skies above Fort Collins at this time during this week. Um, now, with that being said, if you are not watching from Fort Collins, if you're watching from somewhere else um, in Colorado or even the country or the world, that is totally fine. Everything that I talk about tonight should also be visible in your night skies, as long as you're in the northern hemisphere of the earth. Um, if you're in the southern hemisphere, your skies are gonna look very different from us here in Colorado. Uh, so yeah, if uh, you are watching now, I would love to know where you're watching from. So if you wouldn't mind uh, leaving a comment on the video and just letting us know where you might be watching the video from, um, that always gives us a really great idea of who exactly we are reaching with these live streams. Um, and also I want to mention that this is a live stream. This is a live program. So if you do have any questions or comments during the show, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. And I will try to answer those and get to them as quickly as I can. I'll also stick around for a few minutes after the live stream or after the presentation is done and answer any other lingering questions that you might have. All right, so for tonight's program, we're going to be using an open source uh, piece of software, which is called Stellarium. And let me go ahead and get my uh, screen sharing going here. So here we go. And this is Stellarium, and Stellarium is a really amazing, uh, as I said, open source and free program that you can use and download on your own machine at home, on your own computer at home. Um, there's also a web version, so you don't have to actually download anything. If you just want to use the web version, you can do that. Um, and there is a mobile version that I think uh, costs a few bucks, but if you just want to use it on your computer, it is totally free. And this is an amazing tool for getting to look at the virtual night sky so that you can plan your sky gazing trips or even look at the sky from other locations on the earth um, and see what the sky is going to look like from there and this is what we're going to be using tonight to allow me to show you what we have in the night sky so again this is called Stellarium and uh, the last thing that I want to mention before we get started is that you are able to uh, leave a donation for us for the museum if you so choose. Um, if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can use the little donate button just down below the video here. And we really appreciate any support that you can give to the museum. The museum is run by a nonprofit organization, and uh, we really rely on your support to continue to bring these types of programs to you in this time. So you can do that or visit our website at fcmod.org slash donate. All right, so I think with that said, let's go ahead and jump into the presentation for tonight. So here we are looking at Stellarium, our virtual planetarium software. And as you can see, we are looking towards the west here as the sky would appear right now if there weren't some bad wildfires and smoke in the air, unfortunately. Um, but fortunately, here in our virtual planetarium, we can look through all of that and see the sky nice and clear here. So let's go ahead and speed up time so that we can see the sunset a little bit quicker here. And as we do, we will begin to see some bright objects appearing in the sky. Now, it might be pretty hard to spot, but here, following the sun, let's see if I can zoom into this region here. We might be able, hmm, I might be having a hard time finding it here. Uh, Mercury is going to be setting soon after the sun, uh, but will mostly be in the glare of the sun, so it might be kind of difficult to spot. Um, but on one of these clearer nights, ideally, uh, you might go out right as the sun is setting around 630 and see if you can spot Mercury setting behind that western horizon. All right, so now I'm going to turn us a little bit to the south. And we're going to check out a couple of planets that have been up in the southern sky for quite some time now. And you might have seen these two bright objects hanging out just in the south. And I'm going to pause time here. And these two bright objects are 
planets. These, this is the planet Jupiter and the planet Saturn. And these two planets have been hanging out in the constellation or just behind the constellation of Sagittarius, which of course is the centaur archer. Now, Sagittarius is a pretty big, sprawling constellation, so most people tend to find the asterism known as the teapot, which is just this portion of Sagittarius, which is actually very easy to pick out, especially with these two planets guiding the way. And they've been trailing behind Sagittarius for quite some time now. And these two planets are shining bright in the southern skies, as I said, but they are setting. So as you can see, if we move time forward, they're going to be setting in that southwestern sky. <clears throat> these two planets are shining with a magnitude of 0 0.5 for Saturn and negative 2.3 for Jupiter. And if you've tuned in before, you know that the magnitude scale is a brightness scale where the lower the number, the brighter the object is, with a magnitude one being the brightest stars that we can see in the sky. And so Jupiter with a magnitude of negative 2.3 is very bright. It's much brighter than any of the other stars in the night sky. All right, we're going to go ahead and let uh, Jupiter and Saturn set here, and we're going to move time to about 11 p.m. And as we do, we're going to look high above the southeastern horizon, and we'll pause time here. And you might see a bright red object towards the top of your screen, almost, almost directly in the south and it will be directly in the south at about midnight. And this bright red object is the planet Mars. Go ahead and center that up a little bit better. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think that smoke is getting to me a little bit. Uh, but Mars reached opposition last night, just one week after its closest approach to Earth. So at opposition, Mars is directly opposite the sun as seen from Earth. And I can illustrate that with a little graphic here. So as you can see, at this time on October 13th, yesterday, uh, Earth was directly between the Sun and Mars. Now, I did mention that Mars was at its closest point to us last week. And that, of course, is due to the elliptical nature of the orbits of the planets. We don't orbit in perfect circles, but rather in sort of oval-shaped uh, uh, ellipses. <clears throat> and so the closest point for Mars happened a little bit before opposition. Now, Mars is blazing bright at a magnitude of negative 2.6, so even brighter than Jupiter. And it is currently sitting amid the stars of Pisces, the fish, which are for some reason connected by a ribbon. Mars will climb higher as the hours tick by, and the best time to observe the red planet is late this evening in the hours leading up to midnight, when it is high above the horizon. And uh, it's in a relatively dark part of the sky and in a faint constellation. So it will be easy to pick out thanks to its brightness and its distinctive red color. Also, in case you're wondering about the Mars 2020 mission, which is carrying the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter to Mars, they're about 43% of the way to Mars. Uh, which means that they're about 126,982,000 miles from Earth, and they're traveling at a speed of 63,356 miles per hour relative to the sun. That's an insanely fast speed. So they should get there uh, at their due arrival time in February. Now, although... Uh, with your naked eye, Mars appears as a bright red point of light, much brighter than the stars surrounding it. Mars is 
actually covered in geologic and topographic features, which can be identified even with lower power telescopes. If we zoom in here, we can get a pretty decent view of some of these surface features. But Stellarium doesn't do the best job at showing these uh, detailed features. And so I'm actually going to switch very quickly over to another application. Let me stop the screen sharing. Hey, everyone. Uh, and we will share this. All right. So this is an application known as NASA Solar System Track. And this is another free to use application. This just runs on in your web browser. So this is just a website that you can go to and I'll post the link in the comments. But this is a really cool tool from NASA that allows you to explore planets uh, and other objects in our solar system in really great detail using imagery from various probes and satellites that we have sent out to explore our solar system. So, and uh, actually, you may recall going on a tour of the moon a few weeks ago, uh, if you were watching Night Skies of Fort Collins, using uh, this same tool. So here we are. I've lined up this view to be in line with the view that we would see uh, <clears throat> at this time, at 11 p.m. tonight, uh, looking at Mars, if you had a really highly power, high power telescope. And so I just wanted to take you on a little bit of a tour of the surface of Mars. So right at the center of our view is a dark patch. Let's see if there's my mouse. Uh, is this dark patch, uh, which is known as, and hopefully I pronounce this correctly, Mare Cimmerium. This and other dark areas like it are actually ancient volcanic quote unquote seas. And much like the Mare or Maria of the moon, ancient astronomers once thought that these areas could be actual seas of water or even areas of vegetation. Under close inspection in excellent scene, you might catch a glimpse of this feature, these two prongs of darkness coming up here, which are known as Gomer Sinus. A pair of dark prongs poking out from the mare's eastern end. So just to the east of Mare Samarium is this area, which is known as Mare Tarherium, Tar Tarhenum, excuse me, Tarhenum. <laughs> and here we go. Let's zoom into this a little bit so we can see some of these craters and things. So Mare Tarhenum contains the large volcano known as Tarhenus Mons. And that is located right here. And let's go ahead and zoom into that so we can see that in greater detail. This volcano is actually one of the oldest and perhaps the most complex volcanoes on Mars. One interesting feature that you can see here are known as pit chain uh, excuse me, are known as pit chains, and they are found at the summit of Tar Tarhenus Mons. And these are formed by collapse of material into underground voids. You can see these kind of channels being formed here. And if we zoom way in here, you can see a really interesting one here formed of these concentric circles. Now, since they form chains and concentric fractures that are aligned, they're probably caused by extension of the surface. But volcanic processes made the crust pull apart, voids were for formed, then material fell into them, leaving holes. We find pit craters on all of the terrestrial planets, including Mercury, Venus, Mars, and even the Earth and the Moon. That's pretty neat. And this is why I really like these, this solar system trek from NASA, is that you get to really zoom way into this imagery and check it out in great detail. Now, to the south and east, you might notice this really bright area. And this is known as the Hellas Basin. Hellas is the third or fourth largest impact crater in the solar system. The basin floor is about 2000 or excuse me 23,465 feet deep and extends about 1,400 miles east to west. So this is a very large area. 
Now, if you're a video gamer, you may recognize the Hellas Basin as a setting for the video game Destiny 2. So that's kind of fun. If we zoom into the northeastern portion of the Hellas Basin, we should see some very high resolution imagery popping into view just here. You can see as we zoom in, uh, NASA Solar System Trek automatically loads in higher and higher resolution data. And this data, this imagery actually is not color corrected, so it's just in grayscale. But what's amazing is if you zoom into this, you start to see uh, in great detail these amazing features that look a lot like river basins and mountains and glaciers that we have here on Earth. Personally, I could just spend quite a bit of time zooming around the surface of Mars like this and seeing what kind of different features that I could find. Uh, so it has been theorized that a combination of glacial action and explosive boiling may be responsible for some of these gully features in the crater. And scientists have found evidence for glaciers here, which as I said before, you can actually spot for yourself by looking around here. All right, let's zoom back out. And we'll point out our last region, which is this dark, very dark prominent region. And this is known as Citrus Major. And although astronomers once thought that observed seasonal changes in this distinctive feature might be due to Martian vegetation, Today, we know that its fluctuating appearances actually due to sand blowing across the planet's desolate surface. So every now and then, Mars can have really, really bad sandstorms with really high winds, much like the ones that we just encountered here in Fort Collins a couple of days ago, maybe even faster than that, um, that blow the sand across the surface. And what I thought was so cool about this feature is that if we zoom into this, this region here, we can see that the sand has been blown past these craters here, and you can see in which direction the sand is blowing, which is just really, really cool to be able to see. All right, so there's just a quick tour of some of the features that you could possibly see through a telescope if you were to look at NASA, or excuse me, look at Mars around this time of uh, year. And I also wanted to point out actually just something that might be poking out way down here at the bottom and I'm just going to turn us down here. This of course is the southern polar ice cap. And this is really neat and you might be able to see just a glimpse of this through a telescope. Now do remember that some telescopes depending on the optics and how they, how they work on a telescope, all of this might be flipped upside down. So this south polar cap. Uh, might be actually at the top of the image that you are looking at, at your in your telescope, just due to the optics of the telescope flipping the image upside down. So if you see something like this, but it looks upside down, that would be why. All right, let's go ahead and switch back to Stellarium now. And we will, I'll mention a couple more things of note. And once again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments. Now, if we look to the east and allow time to move a little bit more, we're going to see a pretty familiar winter constellation beginning to rise just in the east here. And you might be able to recognize these three distinct stars here as the belt of the hunter Orion. And here is Orion. Now, the reason I wanted to mention Orion is because there is actually a meteor shower happening right now. The Orionid meteors, which fly by each year between October 2nd to November 7th. And that's when Earth is passing through the stream of debris left behind by Comet Halley, the parent comet of the Orionid shower. The Orionids usually put out the greatest number of meteors in the few hours before dawn, and the expected peak morning in 2020 is actually a week from today on October 21st. 
but it's fine to start watching for meteors now. The moon, <clears throat> excuse me, the moon is in a waxing crescent phase with a new dark moon occurring this Friday, providing dark skies for this Orionid meteor shower. Now, meteors in annual showers are named from the point in the sky from which they radiate. And if I turn on our uh, radiant here, you can see that the Orionids radiate or seem to radiate from the club of Orion the Hunter. Now, you don't need to be looking directly towards the club of Orion or even Orion itself as the meteors often don't become visible until they are 30 degrees or so from their radiant point. And remember, they're streaking out from the radiant in all directions in the sky. However, if you do see a meteor and trace its path backwards, you might see that it comes from this area of space. And if so, that meteor will be an Orionid. So, in which direction should you look for a meteor? Well, no particular direction. It's best to find a wide open viewing area. And in fact, you can go out to a wide open area with some friends and look in different directions and see who can spot the first meteor. Now pictured here is an image of the Orionid meteor shower that was captured in 2017 with multiple exposures added to give this effect of multiple meteors being in one shot. Now you're not going to see meteors quite like this all at a single point in time, but over a period of time you will see meteors in the sky similar to this. And this picture uh, was taken actually in China over the Wulan Hada volcano in Mongolia. All right, just one more thing here to show you. And to do that, we're going to turn time forward until the early dawn hours. And we're going to see a couple of bright objects rising in the east here. All right. Now you should see two bright objects rising just in the east here. And these two objects are the planet Venus and the moon. And these two objects are both located very close to the constellation of Leo, the lion. And actually the moon is in Virgo. Now the moon is actually really neat right now because as I said before, it's a very, very thin crescent. And because it's very close to the sun, let's go ahead and zoom into that to see it. You might wanna take this opportunity to look for an effect called earth shine. And earth shine is basically when light from the sun reflects off of the surface of the earth and onto the dark portion of the moon or the shadowed portion of the moon. And this can create a really beautiful glow in this dark portion of the moon. So once again, if you're up early this morning, it's about 6 a.m. just after that, look up to the east and see if you can see the thin crescent of the moon and perhaps a bit of earth shine on the surface. All right, well, I think that about wraps up what I wanted to talk to you guys about the uh, night skies th tonight. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. I will stick around for a few minutes and uh, answer any of those questions you might have. But if not, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And once again, if you do have the opportunity to, we do ask that you uh, support the museum through making a donation of any size. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, you can use the button down below to donate uh, directly to us, or you can visit our website at fcmod.org donate. And yeah, if uh, no one has any questions, I hope you guys all have a great week and join us next week for our Discovery Live program, which is a really interesting program where we bring experts on as guests, uh, guest speakers, and you get to ask those experts any questions that you want about their topic of um, expertise. 
And I believe next week we are going to be doing our first Discovery Live in a series coinciding with our uh, traveling exhibit that we're currently hosting and is open uh, called Mind, or Mental Health Mind Matters. And so we'll be having some mental health experts on and we'll be having a discussion with them about mental health and, and different aspects of that. So if you have any questions about that, be sure to tune in next week right here, same place at 5 p.m. to join in on that conversation. All right, let's see if we've got a comment. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lynn. You saw meteors. That's great. Yep. I bet those are probably Orionids. I did. Uh, I think I saw that Orionids uh, move particularly fast as well. So they can be easy to miss. But one interesting thing is that because they move so quickly through the atmosphere, they actually leave, um, I think it was called an ion uh, trail um, through the atmosphere. And so they can actually leave kind of a lingering trail for a little bit. So that could be really cool to, to look out for. All right. Well, if no one else has any other questions, thank you once again so much for joining me here. It's always a pleasure to get to do this program for you guys. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys get out and keep looking up after, you know, the smoke clears. Awesome. All right. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you next time.